we're back again looking at Anand Sahib and in verse number nine, we're gonna be looking at the importance of divine speech and divine song. And we're gonna be asking a really important question. How do we find the oneness? The ninth verse begins, Come, beloved saints, of the describable let us speak. Let us speak of the indescribable. By which door is it obtained? Body, mind, wealth, Surrender all to the Guru. By accepting divine will, it is obtained. Accept the divine will of the Guru. Sing the eternal message. Says Nanak, listen saints, speak the speech of the indescribable. So here in this ninth verse, Guruji is now addressing the spiritual masters, the spiritual seekers, and Guruji is asking, making a request Please, can I spend time with you? Please tell me more about this divine experience. Guruji starts by saying, Avo sant ho, akat ki karhe kahani. Come, beloved saints, my dear saints, let us speak of the indescribable. So it's a request for a community. And Guru is showing how important it is to have a community where you can sit and discuss and have discourse about spiritual matters. How do we meet up on a regular basis? How do we prioritize this within our life? But Guruji acknowledges something. Guruji acknowledges that what we're talking about is something that is akat, something that is completely indescribable. So Guru knows that the discussion that we're about to have is of something that can't really be put into words. And so what is it that we're doing? What is the purpose of trying to describe something that is so impossible to describe? How can the fish describe the entire ocean? Why would it even try? How do you describe something that was there before time, before everything existed, something that is there now throughout everything but can't be seen, can't be tasted with our tongue or smelt with our nose, we can't see it with our eyes, we can't hear it with our ears. What are we trying to do? What's the purpose of having a conversation about this oneness that seems so indescribable? Now, the Guru has always understood that even though it is something way beyond the understanding of the human mind, we're not having the conversation to try and define it or to try and get clarity or to try and explain what it is in its fullest extent. Guru knows that this is not, not possible, no matter if you get the, the greatest minds together or the greatest spiritual leaders together, you're never gonna be able to fully describe it. But there's so much value in sitting and still having the conversation about it because in talking about it, you almost get to start tasting what it tastes like. You get to have the experience of what it is like to live with that divine experience. So the Guru knows how important it is that even though it's something that we can't fully describe, it's really important to have that community and have that discussion, that discourse on this indescribable thing. Because remember, nothing you say is gonna be a full description of it. Think about it, we talk about this divine as being something that's really grand, and yet, even though it's so vast, it's still in the smallest of things. It's something that our eyes can't see, and yet everything that we're looking at has that divine within it. So there is this beauty that comes from talking about these things because in talking about it, the learner, the seeker, learns how to start molding their mind in order to be able to recognize what they once thought was just a tree or a bird or another person or the air or the wind, now the, the discussion with the, with the spiritual masters allows you to see, oh, I've been looking at it the, the wrong way. And most importantly, you learn how to see yourself. I always think of myself as just me, this person that lives in this body that's this many years old and has this many things in their life. And I always thought that this was me. 
But when you sit with the ones who are greater in their spiritual journey, in their spiritual progression, you get to understand the way to look at the world and the way to look at yourself. So sitting and discussing is so important. And when you sit and discuss, really it boils down to just one question because we can't define it, we can't explain it. So there really is one question that's the only question worth asking. And Guru explains in the next line, let us speak of the indescribable, karhe kahani akat keri, kit dware paye, by which door is it obtained? How do we find it? And this becomes the most useful conversation worth having. And the Guru is trying to clarify that we're not talking about philosophizing, we're not talking about sitting and trying to just get ideas of what it is and what it's like and, and, and debate, is it like this or is it like that? And sometimes you see people who read a lot of spirituality like to engage in, in spiritual debates and arguments. Is God like this or is like that? Are you allowed to do this or are you allowed to do that? What's the best way to live your life? And the spiritual teachers and the Guru is saying that when you sit with the spiritual teachers, the spiritual masters, really there's only one conversation worth having, which is how do I find it? How do I live it? How do I taste it? And time and time again, this same question keeps coming up. At the beginning of the Japji Sahib, Guru Nanak Dev Ji is also asking, what is the way of truth? How do I break falsehood in my life? How do I obtain it? We hear this question around, what words can I say? What can I do? What action can I do? So the most important thing is to ask the question, what am I doing? that is going to get me closer to this divine understanding and this divine experience. So if we think that sitting and talking and discussing about these spiritual matters and learning how do we live this life is so important, then the greatest saint that you have access to is the wisdom of Guru Granth Sahib. It's already there. The wisdom is already there. The conversations are already been happening. So you need to think about it. When did you last ask your Guru? How do I obtain this oneness? We always have a relationship with this Bani, with this wisdom. We might bow down to it. But when did you ask the honest question, how do I find it? And in the next line, the Guru gives the answer as well. The Guru says, Tan man dhan sab samp gurko hukam maniye paye. Body, mind, wealth, surrender all to the Guru. By accepting divine will, it is obtained. And we'll see throughout the Anand Sahib, and in fact throughout the whole of Guru Granth Sahib, the whole of the spiritual scripture of Gurmat has really just one wisdom again and again, hukam, acceptance of divine will, accepting what life is doing is the way. Hukam maniye paye, when we begin to accept the system of the universe. We, when we begin to accept life as it is, reality for what it is and not what we think it should be in our delusional minds, when we start to live life and flow with the river of the universe and go in that direction, the Guru is saying that is how Paye, you will find this divine experience. And we see this echoed right from the beginning of Guru Nanak Dev Ji's lessons, right in the beginning of Japji Sahib. Give Sachiara Hoye, give Gure Tutte Pal. He asked this question, how do I find the way of truth? How does the wall of falsehood fall? And the answer that was given was the same. Hukam Rajai Chalana, walk the path of divine flow. Nanak, that which continues to be written. So this idea of surrendering, Tan man dhan sab samp gurko. Let's understand this a little bit more. Sometimes when we talk about surrender your body, your mind and wealth to the Guru, straight away people start thinking this sounds a little bit cultish. This sounds like there's some cult leader out there who wants all of your money and who wants your body and who wants you to not think for yourself. But we need to go back to our original understanding of what the Guru is. The Guru is not a person. 
There is no person here that you need to give your money to, your mind to, your body to. So we need to understand this a little bit more. We're not talking about a physical surrender of giving up something else. The Guru really doesn't want your money. The Guru doesn't want your body or your opinions. And we've seen this message time and time again, even with within an ansab. We see in verse 2, Guruji says, Sabna Gala Samrat Swami the all-powerful master of all things. So here, it's important to understand that when we're talking about surrender to the Guru, this line talks about surrender your body, mind and wealth to the Guru, we need to go back to our original understanding of the Guru. The Guru and the oneness are exactly the same thing because in verse 2, it talks about the master of all things. Surrender your body, mind, and attachment to everything. So how do you do that? Guru is not talking about giving your body away. Guru is talking about your attachment that you have to your body. Remember what the whole of Anand Sahib is about. It's about how do I live bliss? Remember the question we've, that we've asked at the beginning of this verse, how do I find it? I know what my life is. I know what my ordinary existence is like. I've, I've lived that, I've done that, I've done the worldly thing. I've tried happiness and bliss through every other method. Now, Guruji, how do I find real bliss? And Guru has given the answer, surrender your body, mind and wealth. What that means is give up your idea that this belongs to you. The idea needs to change. You need to mold your thinking that your body belongs to you. That sense of ownership is something that we need to change and the attachment is where all our problems lie. So in order to surrender your body, your mind, your possessions, Guru is really talking about surrender your attachment to these things and be free of ownership of them. And when you're free of the idea that you own these things, then some of the problems that are associated with these things are also start to, to fade away. There's a beautiful line from Guru Nanak Dev Ji elsewhere in Guru Granth Sahib Ji. And he says, Jab asa andesa tabhi kyo kar ek kahe. As long as there are wishes, there are worries. So how will oneness be spoken of? Asa bhitar rahe nirasa to nanak ek mile. Among the wishes remain desireless. Then, O Nanak, oneness will be obtained. So the message here is very clear. If you break your desires, if you break your attachments, that is how you're going to find something greater. As long as you identify that I am me, I am this body, I am this mind, I am this experience, then you are limiting yourself to a very small version of you. The wave only identifies as itself as a wave. As long as you see yourself as the wave, you will have a very short, limited, small experience of life. And here the Guru is trying to educate you, the wave, that you are not the wave. You are the ocean. In fact, the, in, the ocean is the wave. There is no you. So when you start to surrender your idea that I am this, and I want more of this, I want more money, I want a better life in one way or another, I want better job or better body or, or better relationships, when your whole focus is on the body, then all the worries continue to exist. And Guru is saying there's a way, there's another way of living. And that way of living is to be detached from all these things. The next line Guruji goes on to say, Hukam maniho guru kera gavo sachi bani. Accept the divine will of the Guru and sing the eternal message. So here it's saying, Hukam mano guru kera. Accept the Guru's will, accept the Guru's message, the Guru's command. And what we're talking about is not a different message. It's really important here that we don't think that in this verse, the message is about something different. To accept the Guru's will is somehow now a new instruction. And all this time we've been talking about accepting the divine will. 
It's not two different things. They're exactly the same thing. We see in verse 8, we were talking about Gur Prasadi Man Paya Nirmal Jinna Pana Pave. By the Guru's grace, their mind emerges pure, who is pleased with the divine will. So we see this message again, time and time again. The Guru's instruction is to accept the divinity of life, to see life as a flow, as something that has its own direction, something that has a bigger plan, something like an ecosystem that you belong to. Life is the grand ecosystem and you are a very small part of that. But you are a part of it. You're a part of something much bigger. So we need to understand that the purpose of all spirituality is like the wave realizing it is the ocean. It's like the cherry blossom, the small flower realizing that it actually belongs to the tree. It isn't beautiful in its own right. It is the beauty of the tree and it's only here for a small amount of time. If you've ever seen cherry blossom, they look so beautiful when they come up in springtime and you really appreciate, wow, the same tree that we've been looking at all year round for this very short period of time is now bright with these amazing pinks and white colors, these beautiful flowers. Each individual flower is like you, your life. The story is the story of the tree. The tree has been around for decades. But your life is this one little flower that's there for one short season. For a couple of weeks it's there. And then when the flower is gone, it transforms into something else. The flower becomes the fruit. In the same way, we need to understand that we are not this individual limited body. This is not our story. This body is the story of life. And life happens to be now appearing in this particular form. The form of you is life in, you, in the shape of you. And when we start to understand this, we start to realize that we need to change the way that we've been thinking about life. We need to now flow with the wish of, of life itself because it's really not our story. We need to stop fighting against what the flow of the river is trying to do. The cherry blossom, the flower, needs to stop fighting the tree. The wave needs to stop fighting the ocean. It needs to become part of it. So when we're talking about following the Guru's wisdom, following the Guru's hukam, we just need to remind ourselves again. What is the Guru? Remember in verse 1 we talked about Guru is the essence, the spirit of awakening. Guru is that part of the oneness who's got one job. And that part of the oneness whose job it is, is to try and awaken you. It's the wisdom of awakening that is there in everything and in everyone. We all have the wisdom of awakening, but sometimes we need the wisdom shown to us. It's like a mirror. You might have a beautiful face, but if you never have a mirror, you never know what it looks like. You might have the oneness within you. But if you're never shown that oneness, if you're never shown through spiritual masters getting together, talking, discussing, describing it, showing you where you've been looking in the wrong direction, where you've been looking in the wrong way, how you've been doing it, as, how you've been living has not been the way to show you what this oneness is. And so the Guru is the spirit of enlightenment. It's the catalyst to awaken us up. But we always have to remember the Guru and the divine are the same. So wherever the message is heard to accept the divine will or to accept the Guru's will, it's all about learn from the Guru to see the world as part of that divine oneness. And that's been called as hukam. Now the second part of this line is really interesting. It says, Gavo Sachi Bani. Sing the eternal message. Sing the words of eternal truth. What is Sachi Bani? What is the true Bani, the true message? What is this Gurbani all about? So let's look at this word. It's really interesting for us to understand what Bani means. The word Bani means a word or words. It can also mean a message or a language. So when we hear this word Gurbani, 
the whole of Guru Granth Sahib Ji has been summarized as a word, has been called this word Gurbani. And that word Gurbani means the Guru's message, the Guru's way of speaking, the Guru's language, and the words of the Guru, the message of the Guru, what exactly the, su the subject is that the Guru talks about, is called Gurbani, the Guru's language. So, it's not the words spoken by enlightened people. It's not an individual person's opinion or ideas. It's only the true message of oneness, the message that we are all part of one divine system. You belong to the greater story of life. Wherever that message is delivered to you, know that that is the words of the Guru. No matter who is speaking it, no matter where you're getting that message from, know that that is the message of the Guru speaking to you right now. So remember that Gurbani is not the words of the author. And this is why when we talk about Guru Granth Sahib Ji, it's important that we always understand that the Guru Granth is the Guru. The message is the words itself. It's not the individuals that we would sometimes say are the authors of those words. So when we talk about Guru Granth Sahib and it says that this Bani, this verse that you're about to read is by Mahalatija. It's the Guru in its third form. The Guru that appears in a slightly different form from one to another. But it's still the same Guru. It's still the same message. And in the same way, which is why the message that has come from spiritual masters that we would call from other traditions, so spiritual masters from the Sufi traditions, spiritual masters from the Hindu traditions like Bhagat Namdev, Bhagat Kabirji. There are so many spiritual masters whose works are included in Guru Granth Sahib Ji. But we would still say this is the message of the Guru. We don't make a distinction that the message from Kabir or Namdev or Pagatanna is somehow inferior to Guru Nanak's message. It's not. It's the same message that's being delivered. So these are always the Guru's words. It's the wisdom of the Guru, regardless of who that, that person is that delivers that wisdom. And here it's saying, Gavaho Sachi Bani. Now it's not saying, read this true wisdom. It's not saying, understand this true wisdom. It's saying, sing this eternal truth. So Guru is now talking about how important it is that you understand that the words that we're talking about is something greater than myself. In Guru Granth Sahib Ji, Guru Arjun Dev Ji says something really interesting about this. He says, Ho apo bol na janada, me kahya sab hukumao jiyo. I do not speak from my own intellect. All I speak is from the divine commandment. It's really important for us to understand the relationship between words and the divine. When we talk about Gurbani, what is the words itself? It's so important that we understand that these are not words spoken about God. But this is one of the few traditions, the Gurmat tradition, that actually sees the word as something that is alive itself. So these are not words about God. These are God in the form of words. Remember that within this tradition of oneness, everything is essentially the divine. All the stars and the planets and everything that we can see around us is the form of the divine. But the most valuable form of the, the divine for a human being is in the word, in the message, in the spoken explanation of it because that's the only form of the divine that seems to wake us up that seems to get us out of this trance so the divine in all its wonderful shapes and forms is essentially a oneness that has many different styles and colors and sizes and one of those varied forms is in the form of word and so this is where any part of the oneness that is able to awaken you is called the Guru, that awakening element of the oneness itself. So it's really important that when we look at the words of Gurbani, you understand what it is that you're engaging with. You're not engaging with words about God, but rather God in the form of words, the oneness in the form of words that can awaken you to see the oneness itself. So we understand this Gurbani, the message, the Guru, as the eternal voice, the voice of the source itself. In Guru Granth Sahib Ji, there's a really important message that comes up that says, Sat Gurki Bani Sat Sarupa Hai 
ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ ਬਣੀ ਹੈ ਦ ਟਰੂ ਗੁਰੂਸ ਬਾਣੀ ਇਸ ਦੀ ਐਗਜ਼ਿਸਟਿੰਗ ਫਾਰਮ ਆਫ ਦਾ ਡਿਵਾਈਨ ਥਰੂ ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ ਵਨ ਬਿਕਮਸ ਦੈਟ ਡਿਵਾਈਨ ਫਾਰਮ ਸੋ ਸਤਗੁਰ ਕੀ ਬਾਣੀ ਸਤ ਸਰੂਪ ਹੈ ਦ ਵਰਡ ਦ ਮੈਸੇਜ ਇਸ ਦ ਫਾਰਮ ਆਫ ਦਾ ਡਿਵਾਈਨ and through that message we also become that divine itself so notice what the gurbani is trying to do to you it has the ability to transform you from the wave to the ocean the word the message has the ability to transform you from individuality to universality to totality you begin to understand that you are not the individual you are not the limited body or the limited mind you are the expanse of the universe itself you are that oneness or more accurately that oneness is you and the message here is when you've understood this when you've sat with the divine masters when you've understood or when you've gone into the habit of constantly surrounding yourself with this message then the instruction is gavo sachi bani sing this message the instruction now has moved from just purely reading it purely understanding it living it to now making your life a part of this divine song so it is about surrendering your mind your attachment accepting the oneness and now singing about it we need to stop at some point in this spiritual journey always seeking god always looking for it trying to think how am i progressing in my spirituality remember in the beginning of this verse it says how do i find it come saints tell me where do i find it where do i look and the instruction from the divine masters the the, the enlightened people has been at some point you need to stop asking for it and you need to start rejoicing in it it's everywhere it's here and in the very words that you use to to understand it turn those words into a song so guruji is saying that we need to make our life into a divine song and we've seen this message time and time again from verse 1 itself we saw all about turning your life into a song and this is such a beautiful way of living life because we start to see that all of life is a flow the whole life is a melody a harmony an orchestra of beautiful sounds and the orchestra is changing and sometimes it's very calm the melody of life and sometimes it goes up and down and things start to change and we don't know what's going to happen next it's it's this beautiful sound of the universe and it's saying if you can begin to understand life as a song and you go with that song you sing along with it then the anand the bliss of life the bliss of that song that is all around you starts to become your lived experience itself so you start to see life as this unending musical magical song itself and when we understand life as a song then our attachment to individual characters or individual circumstances becomes less imagine that you understood that you were just one instrument in this grand orchestra of life itself your attachment now becomes less when you recognize the grand sound when you recognize that you're just here to play your part and eventually you won't be here but the song of life continues you start to see how you've created so much tension and worry in your life by having this limited understanding of yourself by just being so focused on you as the individual you've created so much worry in your life and guru is saying hey there's a greater song that's going on and if you tune into that song if you become a part of that divine singing then you will see life for what is really going on and you start to surrender your own attachments and you just start to flow with the beauty of life itself and when you sing these divine words your life becomes a divine song and this is so important that you need to start making your life into a song into a melody because it really is there's so much beauty in your life and what we do is we 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 so easily fall into the trap of 
only seeing the problems in our life, only seeing the things that we want to change and make better. But very rarely do we sit back and just think, think wow, look how much there is. Look how much is going on. We saw this in verse 7. Guruji said, Andro jinka moh tutta, tinka shabd sachesavaya. Those whose attachments have broken from within, through permanence, their word is perfected. Remember we talked about how the things that you talk about change. The way you speak changes. And Guru is saying that if you tune into the divine song, your life becomes a song, your words become a song as well. So it's so important that we look at the structure of this verse and we understand what are the messages that we're being given. The first message was spend time with spiritual masters to understand how do we live our life. Then we understand that we have to break our attachments, tan man dan. We have to surrender how we attach ourselves to life itself. How the wave has always thought it's a wave, you need to surrender that way of thinking. There has to be a willingness inside you that says, I'm willing to be more than I am. I'm willing to understand my, myself as part of the bigger story. I'm willing to give up the limited part of me so that I can feel and experience the unlimited side of me. And so Guruji is saying, break your attachments, surrender. The, what the Guru is saying, give it all to the Guru and says, you know what, my body belongs to you, my mind belongs to you, life belongs to you, because in reality, of course it does. The wave just finally waken, wakens up and says, of course, everything belongs to the ocean. I was never the wave. I've never been this wave. This has never been my story. It's always been the story of the ocean. The ocean is the wave. The wave isn't even here. All there is, is the ocean in various forms, in various shapes. And sometimes, of course, it's going to go up and down and sometimes it's going to be a storm. And sometimes there is going to be times where it feels like it's too difficult. But if you step back, see the bigger picture, then you always notice that the storms calm down. Life will always mellow out. You will always be able to get into a space of tranquility, but you have to be willing to let go of your attachments of yourself, attachments towards the story of your own life, like it's the most important thing in life. You have to break that attachment. And when you can start to turn each moment into a joyful me melody, when you start to truly rejoice and sing, then it sets you free. Song leads to salvation. Song and singing leads to your freedom, to your liberation. When life becomes a song, when your birth and death becomes a song, then everything in between it is also part of that divine song. So every gain, every accomplishment, every loss, every tragedy is no longer yours. You are no longer the owner of any of these things. It's all the tragedy of life. It's all the gain of life, the accomplishment of life. Nothing belongs to you. Because you realize that everything is no longer your possession. It's like God's possession and it's God's problem. I like to think everything is good because everything is God. Everything is part of this oneness. You know, when... when when you have teenagers at home, sometimes they put a sign outside their door that says, my mess, my problem. And really that's a message to the parents that's saying, don't touch anything. Everything in this room is for me to deal with. I don't want you to, 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 to clean up my room. But when we become adults, everything becomes our mess. We don't just limit it to one thing. The whole world becomes our problem. Even if there's things on the other side of the planet that we can't do anything about, we take on the worries of it. We start really thinking about what do we do about that and, and isn't it so terrible that this is happening and that's happening and of course there are terrible things that are going on in the universe all the time but you're not going to fix them from a state of agitation if you're able to do something about it by all means do but do something or don't do something that isn't the point the point is are you in your bliss are you in the right frame of thinking are you able to understand that you aren't the center of the whole universe. 
Are you able to understand that this is just part of a bigger story of life? And life has a way of dealing itself. It's not that you don't have to do anything or you don't have to try and fix anything. It's about don't take life so seriously. There's a great sign that I saw that said, don't take life seriously because nobody comes out alive. You're never going to come out alive. That, the, 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 we all know how this story is going to end for you and me. And we don't really think about it in that way. We don't really understand it. So we think that while I'm here in this limited time, I need to just solve all these problems. But the Guru is saying, really, there's only one thing for you to do. There's only one problem for you to solve in life. You need to recognize that you are part of something greater. Because the opportunity for a human being, by the, 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 the divine teachers have always told us this, Look, everything is part of the oneness. The trees and the animals and birds and rocks and waves and oceans, everything is part of the oneness. But the human being has a separate duty to all of these because the human being has the capacity to sit back and experience it. The human has the ability to connect with it in a way that other plants and animals can't. And the reason is because you have a mind. Now the Guru is saying and all the spiritual teachers are saying, transform your mind, see this as an opportunity for what it really is. In this lifetime, in this body, you have an opportunity to connect with what you are a part of. You have the opportunity to see something so much greater and you realize what life is really about. So this whole verse is about letting go of ownership and recognizing what you really are. Recognize that you are the essence of life and then flow with it. In verse 7, Guruji ends by saying, Keh Nanak, eh Ananda hai, Anand Gurte Janiya. And we're seeing the same message reiterated here. Listen to the Guru's message. Hukum Maneo Guru Kera Gavo Sachi Bani. If you listen to the Guru's message, if you understand what is being taught here, then you'll see that Gavo singing is such an important part of the Sikh spiritual tradition. The Gurmat spiritual tradition has put so much emphasis on singing itself. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but Gurbani is structured by song. If you think about Guru Granth Sahib Ji, for those of you who are familiar with it, Guru Granth Sahib Ji could have been structured in any way. Really, it is a book of songs. It is a Granth. It is a huge manuscript with so many different messages all assigned to music all assigned to poetry there's no prose there's no chapters that are just explaining one subject by another and the whole of Guru Granth Sahib even though it has so many different songs could have been categorized by subject it could have been categorized by here are all the verses on anger and here are all the verses on oneness, and here are all the verses on death. But Guru didn't do that. How did Guru categorize all of these? Guruji did it by song. It has been put into music. So every chapter in Guru Granth Sahib is really just a different melody, a different song. So you start to see how important music is to Guru Nanak's spiritual tradition. Look, his best friend that he traveled all around the world with was Pai Mardana, was a musician. And every question in Guru Granth Sahib Ji has been answered so poetically, so musically. So we, whenever Guru Nanak Dev Ji was given a question, he didn't come up with an answer. He said to Pai Murdana, he said, start playing your instrument because the answer is coming to me in a song. And the answer would always be delivered as music, as melody. So there's so much in Guru Granth Sahib Ji that is attributed to song. The very beginning of the Guru Granth Sahib Ji is Ikwankar, is this divine sound. You're explained the oneness through a sound. The end of Guru Granth Sahib Ji is Ragmala, which is the which is the categorization of all the different melodies in Guru Granth Sahib Ji. So there's so much that we understand that Guru Nanak Dev Ji was not just a speaking Guru. In fact, Guru Nanak Dev Ji was a singing Guru. And if the Guru of this tradition is the singing Guru, then we understand that our path is singing. Song becomes the most important part. Song is the method of Guru Nanak to enlightenment. 
And we need to sing so deeply the divine song that the singer disappears and the song appears. We've got to sing so deeply that we just get lost in the melody of that song. And I'm talking about both physically singing, but more importantly, what we're getting with Anand Sahibji is it's not just about physically singing, it's about making your life into a song. So Anand Sahib isn't just the song of bliss. Anand Sahib is showing us that song is the way to bliss. That if we just let go of life, if we just rejoice, if we sing, we will begin to feel how beautiful life can be. And this becomes Guru's answer to the question, how do I find it? Let go, surrender, surround yourself with knowledge and sing. This is the way to bliss. Answer these questions either by yourself or in a group. Is it important for you to meet and discuss spirituality with others? What do you feel is the relationship between Guru and the Oneness? How can your life become a song? What can you do to surrender your body, mind and wealth to the Guru? Thank you.